Chances are, if you've heard of the Hawker Typhoon, you've also heard that it suffered from some teething problems as it was pushed into service. Today we're going to talk about one of those specifically, and that is the tail failures. I'm going to discuss some of the modifications that were embodied on the Typhoon to correct this, as well as the plan for Typhoon Legacy and JP-843's return to airworthiness. Getting an accurate figure on the total number of Hawker Typhoon losses caused by structural failure in the tail end is very difficult. Officially, the record was 25 aircraft lost, however one of those was actually found to have been caused by a flak strike. In addition to that, there's some that are questionable because it was never proven exactly what happened. So officially the number is 24, however it could be as high as 28. Hawker began the design development of the Typhoon in 1937, but with war quickly approaching, precedence was given to the production of the Hawker Hurricane. The Tornado Development Program and the Typhoon Development Program were left with the resources remaining. The first prototype Hawker Typhoon flew in February of 1940, but it wasn't until summer of 1941 when deliveries of production machines began. This was the first contract of 250 aircraft being built by Gloucester. Deliveries were finalized at the end of summer 1942. It's worth noting here that a lot of these aircraft went directly into storage because of the lack of Napier Sabre engines. Only weeks after the deliveries were complete on the first batch of aircraft, the first recording of a structural failure in a typhoon's tail occurred. This was with the loss of the aircraft and the pilot. Very shortly after that, a second typhoon crashed, this time with the loss of Hawker test pilot Kenneth Seth Smith. This second confirmed failure was a massive motivator for engineers and the Royal Aircraft Establishment to figure out what was happening here. Early on, the failures were suspected to have something to do with the vibrations in the airframe that were known to be a problem or elevator flutter. Every calculation was run and the airframe and the elevator and the mass balance were all capable of handling regular flight loads. With tailplanes continuing to fail and typhoons continuing to crash due to structural failure, there is still no sign of exactly what the cause was. It was discovered during the examination of wreckage that the tailplane spars had cracked. So one of the first modifications that was introduced was modification number 256. Modification 256 introduced a doubler plate on the inboard end of the tailplane spars. This was to reinforce the area and hopefully prevent cracking. It was later accepted that the cracking on the tailplane spars was likely caused by the tail section trailing behind the main aircraft by flight control cables. Although there's a few different designs of elevator mass balance, the, the premise behind them is all the same, and that is to eliminate or remove the potential for flutter from flight control surfaces. The next modification in line was number 257, and that dealt with strengthening of the elevator mass balance arm. The Typhoon used a remote static balance system, so instead of using weighted leading edges like a lot of aircraft do, the static balance was actually placed on the tailplane front spar bulkhead and operated remotely from the elevator torque tube through a series of levers to the balance weight itself. Hawker Typhoon modification 258 is the next one that we're going to have a look at here, and this is a little bit more substantial. They found some buckling fore and aft of the transport joint, and uh, as part of their process in basically guessing it was what was causing these failures, they started strengthening these areas up. 258 does exactly that, and it introduces a new frame just after the transport joint in the rear monocoque section called frame M. In addition to this, they also reduced the rivet pitch along stringer number nine forward of the tailplane spar bulkhead, and they also reduced the rivet pitch along the bottom of the tailplane spar bulkhead and its attachments to the skin. Next in line is Typhoon modification number 272. And this is an interesting one. I think you can see it behind me right here. That frame didn't exist on early Typhoons. That is frame JK. 272 introduces frame JK as only a quarter frame, again because of buckling forward this time of the transport joint. The quarter frame segment was placed at the top of the fuselage and eventually was just replaced with an entire new frame. In addition to this, modification 272 also had some work done in the rear monocoque section. On the lower side of the forward tailplane spar bulkhead in the rear monocoque, there's a, a large oval hole or an access hole. With 272, there is an introduction of two stiffening channels and additional fasteners to hold that access door in place. 
The next modification I'd like to discuss is modification 286. And I'm sure most of you know of this one. This is the, a lot of people call them fish plates. Uh, Hawker referred to them as butt straps. These butt straps are placed all the way around the transport joint and help carry loads between the stringers in the forward monocoque and the rear monocoque. Even with all of these modifications in place, the tailplane failures were still occurring. They were just separating forward or aft of the transport joint. The solution for the Hawker Typhoon tail failures didn't come until mid to late 1943. And this was only because the Royal Aircraft Establishment took a Hawker Typhoon airframe, they lowered the main pressure in the tires and suspended the tail from bungee cords and performed resonant testing, resonance testing on the airframe. Now what they found was there was two nodes within different frequencies on the airframe. And a node is basically a neutral point in a frequency to which everything around it is moving and it stays stationary. One of these nodes at a very specific frequency was directly adjacent to the elevator mass balance. And they believed that this rendered the mass balance ineffective in controlling elevator flutter. Armed with this new information, they found that they needed to mount quite a substantial inertia weight to the control column and modify the weight on the elevator mass balance itself. Once these were imparted as modification number 353, the tail failure stopped. There were still a few more modifications that had to do with this, but they weren't corrective. They were more maintaining status quo after they figured out what happened. And those were added as the Typhoon changed to the larger tailplane and the four-bladed propeller. There's very specific weights that need to be placed in very specific areas to balance out the current fitment of each airframe. Before we move on to the next aspect of this video, I'd like to express my sincerest thanks to Chris Thomas. Chris is who I'd refer to as the foremost authority on Hawker Typhoon history, and he was able to provide some images and some details that I couldn't have done this episode without. As we move forward with the airworthy rebuild of Hawker Typhoon JP843, it's absolutely critical that we incorporate all of these hard-learned lessons and their respective modifications. Another thing that we really have to look at is the configuration of JP843. She was a small tail plane, three blade propeller aircraft, and we need to make sure that we stick to the exact recipe that Hawker put together for the balance of its flight controls. Although the Typhoon's transport joint was strengthened and saw service and production right through to the end of the war and SW serial number Hawker Typhoons, I don't think it was the best design and I don't think Hawkers did either. They provided us with another option. The original Typhoon transport joint was two sheet metal frames, very much like the forward monocoque frames that you've seen produced for JP843. One was placed in the forward monocoque and one was placed in the rear monocoque. However, there was a 2.1 inch gap in between them. This gap was spanned by a, an aluminum sheet metal doubler and all loads between the two sub-assemblies were carried through the skin and the doubler itself. As development of the Hawker Typhoon evolved, Hawkers started drawing some fairly major changes to the design. Originally, it was referred to as the Hawker Typhoon II, but these changes became so extensive that they renamed the aircraft entirely, and this became the Hawker Tempest. I've been unable to prove exactly when the changes took place, but it's estimated that approximately the first 50 production Hawker Tempest 5s contained the Typhoon-style transport joint. This was the two sheet metal frames placed 2.1 inches apart, and using Typhoon Modification 286, the external butt straps. This was changed with Hawker Tempest Modification number 49. Tempest modification number 49 removed those two sheet metal frames and introduced two extruded frames that were placed back to back and bolted all the way around the fuselage. This, in my opinion, is a far better design. And I believe it was in Hawker's opinion too, because that was not only on all Hawker Tempest 5 Series 2 aircraft, all Hawker Tempest 2s and all Hawker Tempest 6s. One issue that pops up for us, including Hawker Tempest modification number 49 into JP843 is the fact that these extruded frames are a strong material, very thick, and the procedure required to form them to the correct contours, which is actually quite uh, substantial, is beyond my personal expertise and it's beyond the equipment within the shop. So to be able to do this, we really had to team up with some of our corporate sponsors and find new sponsors to help us out with this. And we're very fortunate to find Versiform Corporation in Langley, British Columbia, who just so happens to be very close to our heat treatment sponsor in Abbotsford, British Columbia, Pyrotech Aerospace. I discussed our situation with Simon Shivers of Versiform and he was more than happy to help us out. And Versiform provided free stretch forming services to help Typhoon Legacy produce these components for the aircraft. The overall process isn't quite that simple though. While the beginning of it is very similar to our sheet metal frames that we produced in-house, 
we start off with CAD design, we uh, determine all the dimensions and the contours required, and then the tooling is designed, all done in-house by Bruce, my father. Uh, the loading of these form blocks that we're using was significant as well. So we went out to a company called Dependable Industries and had them use their multi-access CNC router to produce stretch form die blocks for us out of uh, laminated alder material. And this allowed us to capture exact dimensions, exact angles, exact contours, and just make perfect stretch form dies. As soon as the material arrived, um, I went to work with it and started machining the legs down to the hawker requirement prior to stretch forming. Of note here is the fact that because this process was drawn out over quite a bit of time and we had quite a bit of investment with a lot of partners helping us out, we wanted to make sure we had success once we were done. And to do that, the best way to ensure that was to spend uh, twice as much on material. I think we, we spent $900 on the extrusions required and we bought double. Um, this allowed us to make a uh, two of each component and that's two of frame K, the mono forward monocoque side of the transport joint left and right, and two of frame L, the rear monocoque side of the transport joint, left and right. So in all, we ended up with eight pieces, and uh, this was to help prevent anything, should something go wrong during the forming process or the fitting process, that we'd have a spare and wouldn't have to go back through the whole process again. With the machining complete, all eight components went off to Pyrotech Aerospace for a full anneal, and this was to soften the material to aid with the stretch forming process. As soon as this process was complete, Pyrotech shipped the parts to Versaform, Dependable shipped their tooling to Versaform, and I hit the ferries headed over there to meet with Simon Shivers, their president. Hello, I'm Simon Shivers. I'm the president of Versaform Canada here in Langley, British Columbia. Um, by way of introduction, our company is a manufacturer of stretch form components to primarily the OEM aircraft uh, assembly business. Uh, we sell to tier ones and also to some uh, OEMs as well. Uh, we make parts for Boeing product, for Bombardier product, uh, some Airbus parts as well as um, uh, large uh, MRO operators in Washington state. In addition to skin forming, we manufacture longitudinal parts. And longitudinal parts can be extrusions like Ian's Typhoon parts here. Or they can be brake forms, or they can be roll forms, uh, which are roll form shapes like seal retainers and that sort of thing. And those types of parts are manufactured on, on this style of swing arm machine here made by a company called Ciro Bath in, uh, in the United States. This is a good example of seal retainer material that we make. So this is a small extrusion with a bulb on the end of it. And you can see that that's formed with the part on a fairly severe angle. Here is a hoop that goes into a helicopter MRO program. And uh, again, the challenge with making parts like this is the, not just the cross section uh, or the contour, but it's also to get this, you have to avoid thinning. So there's a real um, challenge in terms of of uh, the amount of stretch you put into the part. So once the parts go through forming and age, they, uh, they are machined in our five axis machining centers. So this is uh, Haas's latest contribution, it's a VR8. And finally, when all that's done, the parts come in here towards uh, our deburring department. where our staff of deburrers do their thing.
After all eight components were pulled to shape, every one of them was shipped back to Pyrotech Aerospace for a solution heat treatment. Now, if you want more information on this, we did an episode a while back on solution heat treatment that'll explain the, the process that they went through. They were shipped on ice back to Versaform then and put back into the form blocks and pulled one more time to their final form. With a solution heat treatment, they naturally aged, went back to Pyrotech Aerospace for testing and certification, and have now arrived at our facility. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and I've used a laser to make a very simple template to transfer the holes and do the basic trimming of these frames. With the rough trim already complete, now it's time to line up the, uh, the frame segment with the template itself. So making sure that each end, uh, top and bottom, are lined up properly with the outside edge of this, uh, the form that, or the template that we have here. Um, the template is the exact profile required between the faces of frames K and L, so it has to line up perfectly with the outside edge on each component. I'm just going to line up my ruler with the center line that's drawn. Again, transferred from the other side of the template. All right, so we have a port side and a starboard side. I'm gonna go ahead and put the port side on the port side and the starboard side and the starboard side. Like a glove. Now installed on the fixture, frame K, the forward side of the transport joint. If you're watching this episode on our paid subscription channel, you're making a massive difference. These transport joints were covered by the difference that you're making. So if any of you are watching and you're not a paid subscriber, please consider subscribing. It really helps the airworthy rebuild of Hawker Typhoon JP843 Advance. Until next time, guys, take care. Cheers.